All right, we are now live. Um, this is the part of the show where we usually wait for people to slowly trickle in. And once we see it's at a decent uh, amount or if we're waiting for too long, then we can uh, just go ahead. But I'm just gonna take the time to share this video as much as I can to all these different pages. And uh, we should get a few viewers from there. Waiting, waiting. Okay, so we're getting a few eyeballs so far. So far, two people are watching. Very good, very good. All right. <laughs> Somebody says they'll already trickle in my ear. All right. Well, we're starting off very strong, I see. All right, I'll just give it another minute. Just gonna do all the social media crap first. I think we're decently getting a decent amount here. I'm just going to finish up this post and then we can start talking. All right, social media posts have been posted. Now I gotta start talking before people start losing interest. So hello and welcome to the second episode of Gut the Punks here on the Bucket List Entertainment Network. My guest tonight is Remy Caffon of At The Movies With Iconic Sounds, which airs Tuesdays at eight in the morning on CJLO 1690 AM. How are you doing, Remy? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. This is exciting. <laughs> yes, it is. So um, I must admit, I don't know too much about you, Remy. Could you just tell me how you got involved with radio? Sure. So it was back inside of 2013 when I had the original idea for At The Movies with Iconic Sounds. So I basically wanted to do a radio show dedicated to the scores and soundtracks of cinema. But having a permanent co-host now of Danny Obrey, the show has transformed over the years, and now we have um, discussions about films. We do anniversary reviews for um, important films that celebrated anniversaries. Uh, recently, we did Silence of the Lambs, John Fidemi's film, mm -hmm. which celebrated its 30th anniversary. Uh, we also talk about directors, too. We normally focus on to a director at the end of the month, every Tuesday at the end of the month, where we try to talk about the director, he or she, and how they have shaped our love for film and for film criticism. But still keeping with the roots, we tend to focus on two scores and soundtracks. So for the month of October, we decided to have a Carpenter Days, where we yes. focused on the composer John Carpenter, which was an excellent episode to put together. And how long have you been involved with CJLO? So I would say 2010 going back. Okay. But wow. then I came back into the mix probably inside 2013 when I finally decided that I want to do a radio show and it's going to be dedicated to scores and soundtracks to movies, which I feel that that was like a very niche market, especially for radio here inside of Quebec, where there was only one person who I knew Sunday nights on the French CBC who would dedicate a show mm. to the scores and soundtracks to movies. And that was about it. So not that much airplay for film composers and score soundtracks, which I wanted to rectify that inside of the airwaves. And 
how are you with horror films? Do you like them or do you like all kind of horror movies or are you very picky about what kind of horror movie you like? Okay, so here's the thing. My parents do not understand why I go and see horror films, but I go to see them because there is something different. There's something that is there definitely with the A24 series and mm. films like Ari Aster's films or um, even Jordan Peele, what he's getting into now with the horror genre too. I feel that there's something to be said. Um, originally getting into horror films, I would say my first horror film might have been The Ring on VHS. Oh, on VHS. This was oh, when okay. VHS is still existed. <laughs> Can't... <laughs> Something to be said there. I think that my first 16 rated horror film was probably Rob Zombie's reboot of Halloween. Mm. But it started me off on to watching the Halloween franchise. So I've seen a few in between. I rate by far um, the original as a masterpiece. It's like right. quite literally the original slasher film, which is celebrating its uh, theatrical anniversary, I do believe, today. Yes, you're right. I think it yeah. came out on October 25th, 1978. There you go. And um, yeah, there's left to be described about Halloween Kills. Maybe we'll get into that if later on if you ask me about it. But yeah. Sure. I still haven't seen it. So I, okay. I don't have much. Uh, I can't say much about it. But uh, based on the reviews I've seen, <laughs> I guess there's not a lot of positive stuff to see, say about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. No. That's it. Not a lot of positive stuff. I mean, to quote the Rolling Stones review, I think that he's uh, Peter Travers wrote that Halloween kills kills the series, <laughs> if that's any way to put it. Yeah. That's really harsh, though, because I was talking about this earlier this week. I mean, last week, really, about how, you know, there's a lot of stinkers in the Halloween franchise. You know, not only do you have, like... Um, Halloween Resurrections or uh, H2O or even the Halloween with Paul Rudd is pretty bad as well. But yeah. I mean, to say that Halloween Kills is the worst of them all, I find is a bit harsh. But I mean, I've yet to see it. So we'll see how bad that is. Yeah, no, I was happy when I exited the theater. <laughs> to say the least. So uh, you did mention John Carpenter and uh, yeah. his music. So do you have a particularly favorite John Carpenter film or favorite John Carpenter score? Okay, so here we did, um, I did a John Carpenter retrospective, I think, and talked about him as the director for the Director's Influence series. So I watched a few of his films, and I have to say one of my favorites is the original The Assault on Precinct 13. Mm. It's one of my favorite scores from his and probably like one of my favorite movies of his. And that's not even a horror movie. It's more of like an invasion film right. type where it's like a not a home invasion, but a police invasion. Mm -hmm. But the villains in that, like the bad guys, they're almost zombie like they're subhuman. You don't really like they don't have much of a personality. They just like are there to be killed, really. No, exactly. <laughs> So there was an ulterior motive for me uh, inviting you to this on this particular date, because right now we are doing the funding drive at CJLO 1690 AM. We are trying to reach our goal of $5,000, though I think we're about $3,000 in and we're maybe only like four days into our funding drive. So we're doing pretty well. It's but, crazy. Um, Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could you just tell uh, the people watching what CJLO means to you? So CJ Lo is like a second family at Concordia after I left Concordia, where it's a family that accepts me for my radio show and what content I put onto my radio show. And we share a love for movies as well as a love for music. So yeah, it's really a second family at Concordia after I left Concordia. So I definitely love the institution of CJLO and what it represents and just the humans behind it who are mm -hmm. the volunteers and the DJs and the staff and just everybody's like a welcoming person over at CJLO and it's such a great organization to support and to support you know local um, music such as my show which plays um, you know 
scores and soundtracks as well too has discussions about movies but not only that but your show every monday that plays loud music yes you know on a monday who 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 doesn't want to you <laughs> hear that on a monday right so um our our mascot this year is a goat and i was kind of racking my brain trying to think what movies are there with goats in them i know there's maybe the witch yeah the uh, witch with um, um, Black Phillip. But other than that, yeah. I'm trying to think of more goat movies, but I couldn't think of any. The one that's like stares out at me blatantly, you might not know this one, but it's called The Man Who Stares at Goats. Oh, it's yes. With George Clooney. Yes. It's about like he has some sort of telekinesis power that the military is using and they try to use it on a goat as like a social experiment, I guess. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I do remember that movie that, that has um, Jeff Bridges and um, uh, who else is in that? Like, I think, I think Kevin Spacey is in there. Yeah. Uh, Pre-Kevin Spacey. Yes, pre-Kevin Spacey. Pre-Scandal Kevin Spacey, even though he, I think he plays the villain in that. He, yeah. he, he tricks people into taking LSD in there. Um, Ewan McGregor is in there, too, and I think he makes uh, like a Star Wars joke in that movie which I felt was like so perfect because, you know, he was yeah. uh, in, in the Star Wars series as well. So that's a good one. Um, but in previous years of the funding drive, we've had several mascots. I think we've all had Paul Rudd as a mascot, but I think the one I remember the most is having Nick Cage as a mascot. Oh, yes. The Nick Cage mascot was, in essence an energy force in itself for the funding drive. Yeah. There's, there's a something about Nick Cage that just like awakens something in people. They kind of like tap into the, like the same insanity levels that he's on. Um, so do you have like a particularly favorite Nicholas Cage movie? Okay. So I did the retrospective last March. Okay. And quite literally my favorite Nicholas Cage movie so far, there's a few of them. So there's adaptation where yes. it's Nicolas Cage playing Nicolas Cage as well, too. So it's like two brothers who are identical, Charlie Kaufman and his brother Donald. And Nicolas Cage both plays Charlie and Donald at the same time. Another one that I can recommend is Matchstick Men, which is quite underrated. It stars Nicolas Cage and Sam Rockwell. It's really well done, that one. Totally underrated. Go and see it if you haven't. But my favorite by far has to be um, his performance inside of Bad Lieutenant, mm. Port of Call New Orleans. It's a Warner Herzog film. And by far, that's like the best Cage performance inside of my book. Like he delivers onto another level inside of that film, mm. both with not only being Nicolas Cage, but being this like morally complex in character where he's a good guy, but he's also a bad guy. And then he comes back to a good guy again. And mm -hmm. yeah, he's like walking the fine balance. And it's funny because he does play like a crack addict in that, but he uses his crack addiction to solve the case that he's working on. So I think uh, the way that movie ends is so perfect. Yeah. Um, I've been noticing kind of like a Nick Cage renaissance once Mandy came out. I feel like all these like, offers for Nick Cage started rolling in and he started doing some great movies like Color Out of Space and recently Pig was amazing as well. Yeah, I heard Pig was amazing. It's something, it's a movie that I need to catch up with. Mm -hmm. I think you like it. I, I mean, everybody compares it to John Wick, but I feel it's like the anti John Wick because, okay. you know, he, he's going on this mission uh, because of this pig that's kidnapped or pignapped. And you think he's going to, like, you know, start, like, digging up guns and shooting everybody that's in his way. But, no, he, he solves his problems through compassion and words and emotion. So it's very much the anti-John Wick. This is, like, a Nicolas Cage that I need to see now. <laughs> compassion, emotions, logic and reasoning. Wow. Yes. Okay. Very... <laughs> Very little yelling. I mean, there's a few Nick Cage freakouts because, I mean, I feel yeah. like he's contractually obligated to do it. But other than I think, that. Yeah. I think that the best Nick Cage freakout is probably the Wicker Man. 
Oh, how to get burned? Yeah. How to get burned? How to get burned? <laughs> and the bees. You yes, know? the bees. Oh, yeah. of course. How could I forget the bees? No, not God, not the bees. Yeah, exactly. That's his uh, best moments. I haven't seen the Nick Cage remake, but I watched the original Wicker Man, which um, mm. I was really into. And uh, this year at Fantasia, they had a great um, documentary all about the history of folk horror cinema. Yes. I don't know if you got a chance to see it, but it clocks in around three hours. So it's pretty long, but <laughs> yeah. it's really I... something to see. Yeah. I watched like maybe an hour of it because it was really on the cusp of expiring. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I got to watch as much as this documentary as I can. But um, I still found it very interesting. And um, yeah, Wicker Man is, the original Wicker Man is definitely a classic. Definitely for folklore cinema. Um, it's almost like you're anticipating my next question. I was actually going to talk to you about Fantasia and... Um, you cover you covered Fantasia over the years for CJLO. Um, what were some of your favorite movies in this past edition of Fantasia? This past edition of Fantasia. Well, I definitely want to recommend Brain Freeze, which I didn't <laughs> get a chance to see at Fantasia specifically, but it's a great Quebec horror comedy that's a zombie film as well, too. It's coming out to, into theaters uh, October 29th, so that okay. would be this Friday. And yeah. um, there's so, there's a sense of a reemergence or a genre in itself coming inside of the Quebec scene of the zombie Quebec zombie films with uh, Les FMA and now right. Brain Freeze. So um, yeah, um, this year I'm trying to think. Oh, Polystyrin, I Am Cliché. Yes, that was great, great documentary one. as well, too. Normally, I go for the documentaries at Fantasia more than any other film. I'm drawn to them. Um, if I can recommend one from the previous year, yeah, sure. it would have to be The Art of Self-Defense with uh, Jesse Eisenberg yes. and Alexandra Nivolo. Yeah, I definitely love that one. That one was one of my favorites. That was a great one because um, they brought in one of my favorite metal bands to star on the soundtrack because, you know, pretty much the story is um, Jesse Eisenberg wants to be tough. So he joins this karate class and he's talking to his um, karate master. I'm not too sure. Whoever's running the class and he's just like trying to figure out, you know, what's wrong with this guy. Like, and he asks him, what kind of music do you listen to? And Jesse Eisenberg says, oh, I, I listen to adult contemporary. And he says, no, you don't. You listen to metal. <laughs> it's like, pretty much forces him to go out and buy a, a, an album by Full of Hell, which was the metal band that was on the soundtrack. And I don't know if you ever listened to metal, I mean, uh, Full of Hell, but it is like very intense, chaotic music. And it's definitely not something I would recommend for somebody who's listening to heavy metal for the very first time. Yeah. Th that scene is very funny too. When he's just inside of his car, listening to like that on full blast. And then you see a car rolling up with like the mother, the father and the kids, you know, just looking at him while he's having like a moment with mm -hmm. the music. But no, I definitely recommend that one. And yeah, he gets mugged at the very beginning of the film. So that's why he wants to take, you know, the self-defense classes to, um, yeah, get better. But also, uh, imagine Poots is inside the movie as well. Mm -hmm. She's very well, good inside the film as well, too. Yeah. I mean, they're a good team together, Imogen Poots and Jesse Eisenberg, because that same year, there was another movie starring both of them called Vivarium. I'm, I'm not sure if you saw that one. No, I didn't see that one out. Have you seen it? Yes, it's a very strange movie. It's essentially, um, I think there are mar married couple who are looking to buy a house in the suburbs and they're shown the house, except they're stuck in the suburbs and they can't get out of the suburbs. There's no way of driving outside of the suburbs. And it's like they're stuck in a time loop every day and they're given a child to look after but this child is very weird it's a very weird movie but i think um i think both those actors have a, a, are very good at kind of expressing confusion in the there's certain predicament 
No, exactly. Uh, that's what's always drawn me to Jesse Eisenberg and the characters that he tries to do. And I especially remember um, one of the ads that you have on CJLO uh, that comes up on repeat is when you, um, it's the David Fincher specific uh, yep. ID where you have um, Jesse Eisenberg as Mark Zuckerberg, a clip of him at the very beginning. Yeah, you have part of my attention. You have the yes. minimal amount. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like that movie almost needs a re like a sequel or a reboot just to see like what Facebook has become like in the post Trump era. I do feel it too. I mean, I just heard my parents outside having a loud discussion about the whole entire Facebook and January 6th and everything that's going on there. So yeah, I know apparently they're rebranding themselves too mm -hmm. as a new name. So yeah, it should be very interesting what this Facebook saga and what's going to happen next. <laughs> it can be a movie quite literally. Uh, David Fincher, maybe, or maybe Aaron Sorkin could mm. be back to direct or um, there was also another one too. The one who directed Steve Jobs. I forget his name right now. Oh, yeah. Uh, Danny Boyle. Good directed. Oh, right. Too. Yeah. Danny Boyle. I think Danny Boyle right now is working on a TV show about the Sex Pistols, um, which was having some like court drama because John Lydon of the Sex Pistols or Johnny Rotten uh, didn't want the the TV show to come out, but um, apparently he lost in court and now is financially bankrupt, and they're just going ahead with the show. So, oh wow, um, yeah, I think that it was being developed for FX, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm definitely interested in seeing that and seeing what comes out of that. FX has like great content as much as HBO dominates the. Um, you know, the primetime television paid for cable um, subscriptions and stuff like that. FX has, like, great content with American Horror Story, Atlanta, right. uh, Better Things. Just name your genre that you want to watch, and FX has something for you, I would say. So uh, you've also been writing articles for the CJLO magazine, and one thing you recently wrote about is... Um, the cinematic depictions of Ted Bundy, the serial killer. Okay. Um, and I feel like there's another movie that you need to add to that list. Uh, it's called No Man of God, which okay. stars Elijah Wood, um, who plays, I think, I, I think he plays like this FBI agent who essentially develops a relationship with Ted Bundy in order to get him to admit to all of these crimes. So they have like kind of this strange and dangerous friendship. I'm kind of interested now because Elijah Wood has done some very interesting uh, stuff with his career from, um, you know, the Lord of the Rings. And now he's doing like, he's gone from the Lord of the Rings so he can progress to like more, you know, little roles inside of films. Uh, there was one, I think that if I do remember was at Fantasia was, um, Come home to daddy or something mm -hmm. like that. Something come to daddy. Yeah. Come to daddy. That was it. Have you seen that one? Yes. Yes, I have. And what was yes, that one? that's another, there's another strange one. Okay. But I, I think he, he, he's very good in it. Um, he, he, he kind of plays like a self deprecating hipster. <laughs> it's, and he's, um, I, I don't know. Did, did, did you see it or? No, I haven't seen it. Okay. But, um, just going back to serial killer films right. for a second, I want to get your take on this one because it's been onto my watch list for a while. I haven't gotten around to it, but um, have you seen The House That Jack Built? Mm, yes, by Lars von Trier. Yeah. Or Trier? I, I think that's how you say his name. Yeah. Many people try to, uh, you know, say Lars von Trier, but many people say Lars von Trier as well, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, what did you think about that one in Matt Dillon's performance? I feel like I really need to rewatch it because I feel like I watched it, but I wasn't really paying too much attention. And then I, 
I listened to a podcast where they said that the whole movie is a metaphor for Lars von Trier's film career. Okay. So like he is Jack and he's like kind of like building this house, which is almost his reputation with these, these dark movies such as Antichrist, um, Melancholia, Nymphomaniac. Um, yeah, the only one that we can have a family movie night would be Melancholia. The other ones like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't even get me started on them. Uh, yeah, I've seen Antichrist um, twice now. Once because I watched it for the first time. The second one because I was doing a Willem Dafoe retrospective. Mm. So yeah, he's worked with uh, Von Trier inside the past too. What was very interesting inside of Antichrist, I learned as a piece of trivia, was that they manipulated uh, Dafoe's voice for the fox inside the film. Oh, the Chaos Reigns fox? Yeah, <laughs> yeah the Chaos Reigns fox. <laughs> That's very interesting. Um, but going back to uh, the these serial killer movies, how do you feel about um, the casting of these attractive actors in the role of these infamous serial killers? Not only with like Zac Efron as Ted Bundy, but you also had um, Jeremy Renner and Evan Peters, who both played uh, Jeffrey Dahmer as well. Okay. So here's what I'll say about the... Um... Zach Efron performs. I caught up with it again today in preparation for the show tonight, but um, I felt that Zach Efron was in sort of command of the role just because Ted Bundy was that type of narcissistic personality who always had to have like a charming type personality to lure his victims or to lure, you mm -hmm. know, people into liking him. So like casting Zach Efron as that is like was perfect casting inside of my book. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that he, you know, he steps out of his high school musical days, you know, by taking on this role, you know, more mature role. Mm -hmm. And um, as for the uh, Evan Peters, I haven't seen those movies yet. I think the Evan Peters one is still in development or hasn't come out okay. yet. But um, one Evan Peters role that you should really seek out is his performance inside of American Horror Story Cult, where mm. he kind of plays like this type of mastermind cult leader-ish type personality, which is an excellent performance inside of all the American Horror Stories that he's done. Yes, I have seen that one. And it's funny because he he plays different cult leaders at different times. Like he plays Jim Jones, he plays um, Charlie Manson as well. So he really got to stretch his acting chops in that one. It's, and it's funny because it just, he just started off as like, you know, like maybe a, a troll or a Trump supporter, but he, he, his character really develops throughout the course of that season. No, definitely it does. Um, so there are different, you know, types of serial killer movies. So, Maybe we can try to define them or I'll try to define them for you. So mm -hmm. you have like the based on, you know, true events of a serial killer, right? Where you have Zac Efron playing Ted Bundy. But then you have other ones that are, you know, more, you know, it's not a real serial killer such as um, Christian Bale as Patrick Bateman. Right. right. Um, another one when you were thinking about like serial killers for this type of... Um, show that we were doing tonight, you know, you can talk about, you know, the slasher films, you know, how Michael Myers is a type of a serial killer. And so is Freddy and Jason, but also um, the Criterion channels doing a retrospective onto home invasion movies. Mm. And one that I can definitely recommend is the funny games, uh, both the Danish and the American remake. They're both like excellent. And, Funny Games, the American one, stars Michael Pitt, who is like pitch perfect as like the villainous character inside mm -hmm. that one. And I feel that he doesn't get a lot of roles or like any credits whatsoever anymore, which, you know, he's a great phenomenal actor when he's playing a bad person. <laughs> and yes, uh, Justin here says Funny Games is terrific. So that's one I haven't seen, actually. And it's been on my list for a while. Um 
but I, I am kind of like, I kind of like do steer away from movies like that, where it's just um, people in a torture scenario, like not necessarily torture porn, but like, I feel like, you know, funny games was like kind of yeah. like within that genre. No, exactly. It's inside the home invasion genre that, you know, gets a little bit inside of the nasty details of that, like later on, which I do understand that it's not for everybody. I'm not saying that, you know, it's a great movie of all time there, but, you know, it's a special type of a movie. So <laughs> the next question I have is yep. not at all related to um, to serial killers. But um, I see that y you saw Sound of Metal, and I didn't get much of a chance to talk to other people about Sound of Metal because not a lot of people have seen that. But I feel um, it's really worth talking about because I feel it's a great movie, and I feel uh, the acting is great, and the sound design is great, and um, it's a great story as well. How did what did you think about Sound of Metal? It is not one of my, it's not my number one film of last year. Mm -hmm. However, I will say that it is the film that I will recommend that everybody sees from last year. That is how good it is. It is a phenomenal film. Riz Ahmed is amazing inside the film. Uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about the history of the film itself because I'll get into that briefly. Yeah, so sure. basically, it was um, the director from The Place Beyond the Pines, and um, he also did, yeah, The Place Beyond the Pines, that one I know, and Blue Valentine. So Derek C. in France, he wanted to do the original Sound of Metal concept, what this band called Jucifer. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've heard of Jucifer at all. Um, Really, the first time I heard of them was reading about Sound of Metal and how okay. Sound of Metal okay. was made. But they're so, essentially the same thing, like they're a husband-wife yeah. uh, duo that plays metal exactly. together. So flash forward, that concept uh, petered out, kind of. But what you got instead was you got Riz Ahmed, who gives a brilliant performance as, like, you know, this type of um, heavy metal drummer who's dealing with not only a lot of, um, you know, inner emotions, but also outer emotions as well, too. And it really shines through inside of his performance. One of my best performances from last year. Mm -hmm. So what was your pick for best movie of last year? Uh, let me go through that really quickly. <laughs> here. Uh, yeah. Well, I can tell you that the one film that I was recommending that everybody sees from the previous year, not uh, 2019, was um, Uncut Gems, probably. Right. Adam yeah. Sandler was great in that. Probably Just great. Yeah. Performance of a lifetime. Um, so my favorite movie of last year was Bad Education, which was an mm. HBO movie with um Elsa Jenning and Hugh Jackman. They're both great inside of it, and it pretty much talks about the corruption of the educational system and how they use the school's funds for their own personal, you know, little personal gains and stuff like that. Interesting. I don't think I've actually heard of that one. Yeah. And another one of my favorite ones was the Small Axe Trilogy from uh, Steve McQueen, streaming on Amazon Prime. And it's a bunch of, I think that it's one, two, three, four or five films, short films from Steve McQueen. Really well done. And then uh, Pixar Soul. Yeah, I definitely recommend that <laughs> yes. one as well, too. Uh, who would have thought would you have thought that uh, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross would have been, you know, scoring a Pixar film, putting the yeah. music to a Pixar film? That That is definitely strange, especially a movie about jazz. Um, that was particularly strange. Like, I know um, John Baptiste, who's also part of um, Stephen Colbert's backing band. I know he did, like, a big part of that soundtrack as well. But... Yep. Um, <laughs> But Trent Reznor doing a Pixar movie, that that's something I don't think I, I would ever live to see. It makes sense that he would do like some David Fincher movies, but not um but not Pixar. No, exactly. They um also scored Mank, uh the Mankowitz bio picture um 
from uh, Netflix also inside that same year. So yeah, they were really onto a hot streak, you know, got to give it up to them. Mm -hmm. So we're slowly uh, nearing the end of this, but um, All right. for the, the for, for the five people who are still watching, if you want to get in some questions, uh, now's the time while we go over our last few uh, questions. First of all, um, this might be a tough one, but do you have a favorite movie soundtrack? Favorite movie soundtrack? Thinking right now inside of my... Well, normally if I buy it on vinyl, it's inside of my favorite movie soundtrack. So Scott Pilgrim versus the World, mm. definitely. Uh, you cannot go wrong with the Wes Anderson soundtrack. And one of my favorite Wes Anderson films soundtracks has to be Rushmore. It has a bunch of great um, artists like The Who and uh, Cat Stevens is on it as well, too. And it's definitely one of my favorite soundtracks. Uh, definitely, I really love the song A Quick One While He's Away by The Who. Okay. And that one's on to uh, the Rushmore soundtrack. As for my favorite scores from movies, um, Definitely Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross for The Social Network. Yes. Uh, Colin Stenson for Hereditary. I really dig that mm. score a lot. And it got me to discover Colin Stenson. And is, um, is he originally from Montreal or it, he has some connection to Montreal? I do not know his connection to Montreal. Okay. Regrettably. I'll, do some, I'll do some research about this. I'll get there back to you about that. Um, but definitely one of my favorite soundtracks going back to it once again, Uncut Gems enters it into um, here with uh, Daniel Lopatin's score for Uncut Gems. And I think that he also worked with them, the Safdie brothers for Good Time as well okay. too. If you haven't seen Good Time or Uncut Gems, make that a priority onto your watch list. Two great films from, you know, these mm -hmm. brothers. Yeah. And they turn out some great performances. Um, Robert Pattinson is amazing in good yeah. time. He, I, I mean, I completely dismissed him just because of, he was part of Twilight. But as soon as I saw good time, I was like, okay, I'm on team Robert Pattinson. I, I need to. I need to see him in him in Batman and everything else. Yeah, there you go. Another one that I can recommend with him that's really good is a uh, Claire Denis film High Life. It is mm. sort of like a science fiction thriller film. That's really well done with him okay. inside of it too. I have to rewatch that one, but definitely recommend that one. Another one of my favorite um, scores of all time. I'm going to give some love to. Um, Mike Patton from Faith No More. Yes. He scored um, the soundtrack for The Place Beyond the Pines, which Ooh. has to be another one of my favorite scores of all time. Okay, now now I have more reason to watch that because... Mike oh, you Patton, haven't watched you... The Place Beyond the Pines yet? <laughs> no, I haven't. Uh, my friends would be like down your throat right now, like, watch The Place Beyond Your Pines. Watch <laughs> The Place Beyond the Pines. No, seriously, they're huge fans of the movie. That's great. Um, so uh, this is the question that we ask all of our guests, but what's on your bucket list? Um, th this usually applies for touring mus musicians, but I think this could also apply to, are there any film festivals you would like to visit? Okay, film festivals that I would like to visit. I definitely would love to visit Cannes one day mm. and see the Cannes Film Festival. Uh, Toronto's onto my list as well, too. The tip, and yes. then another, maybe a toss-up between New York or Venice. You know, the New York Film Festival or the Venice Film Festival. Definitely one of those two to my bucket yes. list. Those are good choices. Um, so, I, I mean, I guess nobody is asking some questions, so maybe we could wrap it up. Uh, for um, anybody who has a radio, what can they expect to hear on your show tomorrow at 8 o'clock? Okay, so tomorrow at 8 o'clock, we're doing the Director's Influence episode dedicated to American director, independent director, Kelly Reichardt. So she's done some movies such as Meek's Cutoff, uh, Night Moves, not the one with Gene Hackman, but the most recent one with uh, Jesse Eisenberg and Dakota Fanning. 
And it's uh, about these environmental eco-terrorists that try to destroy Ooh. a dam, but they cause more damage than good. And um, so Meek's cut off, Night Moves, uh, First Cow, she's also done um, a few other ones like Wendy and Lucy with Michelle Williams, uh, certain women with uh, Kristen Stewart, Michelle Williams comes back to. Uh, however, she's an important director to follow, definitely inside the 21st century for her points of view onto environmental issues, which always come back um, inside of her films. She shows you the natural beauty that the American landscape has to offer. So, for example, in Five Night Moves, I use this as an example. You have Jesse Eisenberg near like a a pit of just like a bunch of waste and garbage and trucks are going by. But inside the vast distance, you see also the beauty of the mountains, you know, the Colorados. So contrasting, you know, both of those two elements together. So that's what you can check out tomorrow too. But I'm also going to remind um, the audience here that CJLO is having a funding drive and to visit cjlo.com slash donate to donate to your favorite CJLO shows. And we also have awesome merchandise, but I also want to plug, um, you have an event coming up tomorrow, Chris. Yes, I was going to get to that, but thank you for reminding me. Um, tomorrow, I am having a Treehouse of Horror virtual trivia. So if you love The Simpsons, specifically if you love the Halloween specials of The Simpsons, then this is for you. It's only $2 to join. And um, just look up the event. I think it's on Facebook, Treehouse of Horror Trivia. It's tomorrow at 7 p.m. And Remy will be helping me out. He will be the one marking all of the answers so thank you for uh signing up to do that to remy because you're helping no me out a lot and uh you, you get to see my mug uh talk simpsons at you and you can win lots of prizes we have an all access pass to uh the ridm festival which uh, is the documentary film festival i don't really can't remember what ridm stands for but we also have eventco tickets up for grabs and uh some other great coupons as well no, I definitely recommend getting your hands on to the um, RIDM Festival tickets. If you're a big fan of documentary films, it's the doc the big documentary film festival that Montreal has every single year. That uh, it's one of my favorites since I do enjoy documentaries. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I have looked up a few of these documentaries. A lot of them are are very like um, are I guess like human stories about people like. Who, who, from all over the world, um, you know, there's a lot of stories that are coming out of Russia, a lot of stories coming from like um, indigenous communities as well. Um, so it's it seems like a very interesting festival. So I'll be talking a bit more of that on uh, the trivia stream tomorrow. So uh, that will be taking place on Twitch. Uh, and so if you want to participate, uh, just send $2 to CJLO and uh, make sure that you have a Twitch account because you won't be able to comment in the section uh, without it. And yes, please, please show up and we'll have a lot of fun. But Remy, is there anything else you would like to uh, tell our viewers before you sign off? Um, no, but I think that we covered everything and just the importance of supporting community radio inside the times that we live in, right? That's what we do it for. We do it for the radio and for the love of radio. Sigillo.com slash donate. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Remy. And thank you, everybody, for sticking around and watching this. And um, I haven't really figured out what I'm, who I'm going to talk to for the next episode. But uh, stay tuned for that because I'll figure that out soon. But thank you, as always, uh, to Remy for coming on. Uh, be sure to listen to his show at the movies with iconic sounds every Tuesday at eight in the morning on CJLO 1690 AM, or you can listen online at CJLO.com. Have a great night, Remy. Have a good one, Chris. I'll see you around. Bye. Bye.